Hi everyone. Yeah, thank you for waiting. Um, apologies, we just literally got caught in the most unfortunate fire alarm ever. Um, but yeah, I will strive to make sure that we um, cover everything and don't run over too much. Yeah. So um, thank you for joining us for the first um, Reduce Reduce webinar of the year. Uh, this will be a sort of covering of what's going to happen in the Reduce Reduce program this year, and then we'll cover sort of an introduction to climate change, um, which will be how did we get here? So how did we get to the climate crisis situation today? Um, climate change today. So what are the current figures? Um, climate change going forward. What is already happening around the world? Our current energy systems, um, again, current situation in terms of sort of progress going forward and what is your institution doing and kind of what you guys can do as well, as we always like to cover um, some of the positives as well as um, some of the things we can do personally and as a group together. So firstly, um, Reduce Reduce Connect um, 2021 to 2022, so this year. Uh, I've split it into learn, discuss and achieve um, and in the next few slides I'll cover sort of what are the seven core webinars. Uh, we also have ideas for some additional um, speaker events so keep an eye out for that as well and the Facebook group which I have sent a few emails about but I'd like to sort of reiterate the use of the Facebook group as well um, and the sustainability advocate awards and then finally interviews which is an exciting aspect as well. So firstly, um, here's just a quick um, covering of the webinars and the dates that they're on. So we've sort of picked different topics this year to what was previously. So um, we've covered things like plastics, greenwashing, and these are all based on feedback from you guys and what we think is important in sustainability at the moment. Um, so the Facebook group, again, we listened to you guys and we decided to improve the interaction between yourselves and give everyone a space to share their opinions from people around the world as well. So we know that a lot of you guys are doing really interesting courses, each have your own opinions on sustainability. And again, you don't want to just hear my opinions the whole time. So um, we've created a Facebook group called the Reduce Reduce Connect Members Forum, and it's a space to discuss sustainability, ask questions, share your unique experiences. So if you have um, an opinion on sustainability specific to your country, we want to hear it in this group and we want everyone to sort of feel like um, they can contribute their ideas and their opinions because everyone's is important in that aspect. So the first topic that we covered in the Facebook group was what do you think the most important um, is most important in addressing the climate crisis? So I came up with a few sort of areas and um, have a think about this question and then at the end of the webinar we're going to revisit that and I'm just going to share my thoughts and we want to hear what you guys think. So have a think about that question throughout the webinar and we'll revisit it towards the end. So the Sustainability Advocate Award, for those who've taken part previously they'll know that um, if you complete a certain amount of challenges that are presented at the end of each webinar, you receive the Sustainability Advocate Award certified by the University of London to say that you have skills and knowledge and contribute to sustainability and good sustainable practice. So this year we've decided to encourage um, improved participation. So complete three challenges, you receive the bronze award, complete four, the silver and so on until complete seven awards um, challenges and you receive the platinum award. Um, and interviews as well. So we wanted to again champion sort of people who are um, contributing to the program and we want to give people a voice so that you don't again have to listen to me the whole time. But um, at the competition winner after um, we sort of review all the details of who's entered and who's entered the challenges. We'll be invited um, to give an interview with myself, sort of a quick five, ten minute interview to share their opinions on sustainability. And this will be shared across all our platforms 
and we encourage that again to start conversation between others and um, champion people who are taking part in the program. So the introduction to the climate crisis. We sort of assume a, a certain level of understanding and we don't want to sort of cover the same ground that um, the same ground that we've sort of covered previously. So we assume that everyone knows about sort of greenhouse gases and the emissions that are causing the warming of the planet. But if not, I'm going to put a link in the chat if you want to cover that as well. So we will begin by giving a quick run through of the climate crisis and focus on the current situation and looking forward. So industrialization starting in Britain um, as soon as human labor was replaced with machinery machinery in the 18th and 19th century these machines required fuel. Humans began to use fossil fuel initially coal was used back then as we moved through the 19th and 20th century natural gas and oil started to be used as well. As technolo technology advanced and dependence on these fossil fuels increased, huge amounts of greenhouse gases have been emitted into the atmosphere. So to give you an idea of the increase, in 1750, there was 280 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And, to, and in by 2005, this had risen to 380 parts per million um, in the atmosphere. And then in 2020, again, it rose to 411 parts per million in the atmosphere. So you can see the difference between, in just a short amount of time, um, the amount of CO2 that we've sort of put into the atmosphere. And on this day last year, the furnaces of the world, so please bear in mind this is just coal, had been burning 2, 2 billion tonnes of coal um, in a year. So that adds 7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere yearly. And an important area to note is that um, industrialization was largely driven by the West and te technological advances were underpinned by European colonialism, um, destruction of natural habitats, resources and genocide of indigenous populations. So that's sort of the background to um, the rapid expansion of technology. So I wanted to highlight sort of where all these emissions are coming from in this is for 2016, but it's largely similar to the present day. And in that you can kind of see that mostly it's been covered by energy. So um, energy use in buildings and transport. And then again, people who um, will be engaged with uh, sustainability and stuff will know that agriculture contributes a lot to CO2 emissions. But yeah, I'll leave that up for a second so you can have a look at where, um, where all these emissions are coming from. So climate change today, um, the concentration, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere in 2021 is 413 parts per million. That's led to a degree of warming of 1.2 degrees currently from in comparison to sort of pre-industrial levels. And you can see on the graph on the right where how far we are ahead in terms of sort of pre-industrial fluctuations between CO2 and how much it's increased in the sort of industrialized time. Um, we've got a sort of 1.5 degrees limit and I'll get on to where that figure has come from later, but they've calculated that we can add 420 billion tons of carbon dioxide um, before we reach that sort of 1.5 degree limit. Um, with current levels of addition, this threshold will be conceded by 2030. So really not a lot of time if you think about sort of nine years ago. So projections going forward, um, if we continue at the current levels of warming, we're predicted to hit four degrees warming by the end of the century, so to 2100. Um, and what will look, what will that look like? So I've got some figures um, that will show sort of the effects it will have on popular places around the world. And much of the world would experience more than four degrees warming. It's important to note that's on average four degrees warming. So Arctic sea and land masses would rise by a predicted 11 degrees. And if you can wrap your head around sort of what four degrees will look like, then you know 11 degrees will be catastrophic. So yeah, as I've seen, there are some pictures here which show sort of the differences between what would happen at two degrees warming. So uh, any of our audience from London will recognize the building, um, Big Ben and House of Parliament. 
show that most of that area would be underwater by two degrees of warming and even worse by four degrees of warming. And yeah, for our North American audience um, and South Asian audience will notice the difference as well. So climate tipping points. Um, if this is to happen, there are large irreversible changes in the state of the environment. Um, where if they're past, we can't as irreversible means we can't go back from this and they'll just constantly become worse with the um, consistent warming. So one of those is the permafrost loss. So uh, a loss of sort of permanently frozen areas of the world would lead to huge amounts of CO2 and methane, which especially methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, the more that these gases are released means the more heating and then the more permafrost loss. So it's sort of a positive feedback loop. Um, that would lead to sort of worse environmental conditions around the world. Um, and the Amazon dieback, this is one that I found in my research quite interesting. So as there's less rainfall and a drier climate, it would mean the forests would dry out, but also less convection currents re resulting in, again, less rainfall and more drying. This would lead to a transition of the Amazon rainforest into a savanna like state. Um, there was some recent news as well, which is quite shocking earlier in the year. Um, that due to deforestation and degradation, the Amazon forest now emits more carbon than it can intake. And it's now emitting a billion tons more carbon than it can intake. So um, previous years, the Amazon was sort of known as a huge carbon sink, and that has changed recently due to climate change and human degradation. So, sorry, um, What's already happening? So 2020 was the third warmest year on record. The planet was warmer by 1.2 degrees Celsius from January to October than pre-industrial levels. Um, and cyclones, floods, wildfires caused large scale devastation. So I'm gonna get into sort of extreme weather events, um, sea level rise and the affecting or how climate crisis is affecting animals. So share your thoughts before I get into that on what are some of the current effects of climate change? If you could want to put it in the chat, what is happening? What do you know about what's happening because of climate change? Um, and I'll give you guys a few minutes to get into that before I yeah, cover my thoughts. Okay, so I'll let people sort of put in the chat um, further if, yeah, if you have any thoughts on what your current um, changes due to climate change are. So extreme weather events. Extreme weather events have increased fivefold in the last 50 years. Um, the North American heat wave of 2020 led to huge amounts of sort of um, loss of life. Uh, some areas got to up to 54 degrees, but we know that climate change has made this event 150 times more likely. Um, I kind of assumed that I knew why um, climate change was leading to these extreme weather events, but we can't always sort of assume that. And of the 405 extreme weather events that have been studied, 70% have been found to be more likely due to human caused climate change. So that's sort of scientific studies that have led to that. Uh, other extreme weather events are drought. So warmer temperatures means more evaporation, um, the drying out of soils and periods with low precipitation, which we know leads to crop failure, um, loss of life due to um, lack of water and yeah, other uh, sort of, for anyone that visited the last water webinar will know how important um, ample precipitation is throughout the year. Uh, hurricanes, warmer waters generally means that more heat energy is available and the higher potential for tropical cyclones to develop. Rising sea levels means more risk of flooding during the hurricane. Um, and I'm going to get into rising sea levels as well. So a case study um, is the Atlantic hurricane season that happened last year. So there were 30 named storms from June 1st to November 30th. That should be 30th. Um, <laughs> September 
uh, there were five storms happening at the same time, so hurricanes, storms and depressions were simultaneously brewing in the ocean only for the second time on record. So you can see how um, rare these kind of things are. And Hurricane Iota almost hit Category 5 and devastated Nicaragua. So another effect, um, sea level rise, if you think about sort of the rising sea levels in the previous pictures that I showed, um, climate change is causing sea level rise in two ways. So the melt of ice sheets um, and glaciers and the thermal expansion of water as it warms. So this also is leading to a rise in sea levels. Um, the global mean water level rose 2.5 times more per year between 2006 to 2015 than it did for the rest of the 20th century. By the end of the century, sea level is expected to have rise by at least a foot, affecting areas inhabited by 200 million people and probably more by that time as well. So if you guys have noticed the sort of um, trend in the information that I'm giving you, it's that in recent years we've experienced um, a lot more dramatic effects than have looked back from pre-industrial times. Um, sea level rise will have a disastrous effect on a huge range of communities around the world and not just sort of uh, lots of places like New York. Um, in 1990, 1 1.2 billion people, 23% of the world's population live near coastal regions. Much of the largest city in the cities in the world were established in um, coastal regions and near rivers. Um, and this number is expected to rise as sort of urbanization increases. Uh, also, it will lead to agricultural loss. So an indirect impact will be the loss of agricultural land, which feeds huge amounts of people. And the increased salinity of the soil will mean that we can't um, grow as much um, food in coastal regions as well. And fresh water loss will impact sort of people's drinking supplies and um, much of the world's drinking water. Hi everyone, it's just Matt here who's moderating um, in the background on the webinar. I thought it might be useful to kind of feedback some of the things that have been popped in the chat there as well. So yeah, thanks Ryan for giving that overview. Um, quite a few people seem to be agreeing with what you've mentioned. So yeah, we've had um, quite a few people mention fires, wildfires, those sorts of things um, in kind of uh, Australia and someone also mentioned them in America as well. Um, people yeah, have also mentioned before you got to it um, that the icebergs making sea level rise as well. Um, and yeah, we've also had kind of a comment coming in saying kind of, yeah, the broad impacts that, yeah, it's really leading to displacement of populations, a loss of biodiversity, floods, droughts and so on, um, which will have a tremendous impact on the most vulnerable people, which is the paradox that as, um, yeah, we live in developed countries and some are, uh, sorry, yeah, that it is them, yeah, those living in developed countries um, who will have the biggest, see the largest impact. Um, where it's actually the developed countries that are the most polluting. So yeah, I think you're going to come on to those bits in a second, aren't you as well? But yeah, no, thank you everyone for popping those bits um, in the chat. It was yeah, great to um, see kind of your understandings of them as well. Cool, I'll let you crack on, Ryan. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's good to hear from um, other people. Um, so again, have we seen any sort of direct impacts is something I want to ask you guys. So if um, you in your personal country or anything or you've noticed a change even from i know a lot of people sort of look at the lack of insects on their windscreen or something like that if you've noticed anything in your sort of life um that has been a direct impact or you could look to climate change as being the answer for it'd be great to hear from you in the chat as well and um matt will revisit that uh, later in the presentation so the effect on animals um Again, we're included in this, but I uh, feel like I should highlight sort of animals are affected by this. So a habitat shift, um, individual species will move their niche to respond to the rising temperatures, will, which will disrupt the food chain. So for example, if um, birds hatch uh, or migrate to a certain area in line with caterpillars coming out of their chrysalises, um, a change in temperature means that perhaps the caterpillars will come out early and that will disrupt the feeding of the birds leading to loss of bird population. But that happens across um, loads of ecosystems around the world. Ice sheet loss, um, increasing temperatures less led to areas of the Ellesmite melting, causing habitat loss for animals and 
lots of areas where these animals can hunt. So unfortunately, I hate seeing these pictures of um, polar bears, but I feel like they're very powerful. Uh, another thing is ocean acidification. So as more CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, the pH lowers, increasing the acidity of the oceans. This can mean that shellfish can't produce their shells. Um, and again, you can imagine how that affects sort of, um, the oceans and things like that. And humans, again, aren't, um, aren't exempt from this. Uh, it will cause huge numbers of people to, that will be forced to move due to increasing temperatures and rising sea levels. So on to sort of climate justice um, and on to sort of the effect that we can have going forward. Uh, I'd like to sort of cover, yeah, what's happening in the current day um, and how we should, because there will be right and sort of um, wrong ways of approaching the climate crisis. So climate justice looks to address the climate crisis, but not ignore the structural racism that means like um, one of the people in the Q&A mentioned, sorry, I couldn't grab your name that quickly, but um, mentioned that sort of there are inequalities around the world and crime, climate justice looks to address the climate change um, crisis as well as that. Um, to make the transition to a sustainable world, these voices need to be amplified and listened to. So um, the person, Azayas Hernandez, aka the Queer Brown Vegan, um, Climate justice is a framing that looks into the current climate crisis as a political and ethical issue rather than solely an environmental issue. I think there are, um, my personal opinion is that sometimes it can be looked as too much of a scientific issue and not look to all the factors that go into um, the fact that we are finding it difficult to change our systems and not looked into the fact that some of the people who are suffering most contribute the least to um, climate change. Um, if any of our listeners also listen to the Climate Cast podcast, um, I'd really recommend it. Uh, Mary Robinson, the former Irish president, who um, is involved in a lot of human rights aspects um, with the UN, describes it really well as there are five layers of climate injustice. So climate injustice is the fact that um, the climate crisis disproportionately affects the poorest communities um, and countries. Uh, Women are disproportionately affected by climate change um, in terms of sort of their land rights, uh, their la lower ability to relocate to other um, areas of countries. Uh, often they're tasked with sort of domestic and agricultural jobs and um, training in agriculture as well. Um, again, age seems like quite an obvious one but it's the future that young people have to inherit so it's disproportionately um, affecting young people as well and the injustice of pathways to development in different regions so as i mentioned earlier western countries have built our economies on fossil fuels and the the whole climate injustice aspect means that we're now telling um, countries that are starting to become more economically developed that they have to do it in a different way and they can't use fossil fuels when that's the whole um, basis that the West is built on. Um, this is important to note that, again, I brought up that we're having a climate and race webinar later in the year and this will be touched on further in this episode. So a lot of the topics I'm covering in this um, webinar will be gone into further depth throughout the year. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, it's Matt again. I thought I'd just pop on and share some of those um, elements of kind of climate change that people are already seeing around the world. Um, so I'll just pick out a couple of those that have been shared with us. Um, so we've had someone um, coming from uh, Merida in Venezuela. Sorry if I, I didn't pronounce that quite correctly. Um, but yeah, they've said that they live, um, the, the city is in the core of the Andes and the glaciers at the top of the peaks uh, are rapidly reducing with scientists having said that um, Venezuela is likely to be the first country to lose all its glaciers. So I think, yeah, that's kind of another another way you can see that that, that real impact there. Um, and I can only imagine kind of how that kind of lack of fresh water and those elements could, could potentially start to affect those communities. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing that one. Um, a little bit closer to home for you and I, Ryan, someone um, from the south of the UK um, have agreed with you that, yeah, they see far fewer insects um, kind of out and about compared to when they were a child. Um, and also less frequent snow days. So um, yeah, I think something every, most people in the UK and kind of lots of other places 
um, have said, uh, yeah, yeah, used to really enjoy, um, was ma managing to miss school when uh, it snowed and you couldn't get in. Um, but yeah, they're much less frequent these days. Um, yeah, they've also commented on longer and more frequent heat waves as well. So kind of, yeah, I suppose even in kind of, um, yeah, the UK, we're starting to see kind of perhaps milder, but certainly starting to really kind of directly, um, yeah, see some of those impacts. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing those bits, everyone. And yeah, keep them coming in and we'll, we'll keep shouting them out. Um, muted. Sorry for that. Um, so we covered that much of climate related issues today are due to industrialization. Um, and I wanted to point my finger at some of the companies that are causing this. So 20 fossil fuel companies are responsible for a third of all greenhouse gas emissions since 1965. Through their extraction of fossil fuels, they have contributed 480 billion tonnes. So these companies include Chevron, Exxon, BP and Shell, as well as state owned entities such as Gazprom in Russia or Aramco in Saudi Arabia. Um, again, we'll sort of get into uh, specific um, pointing fingers at um, specific companies in our greenwashing episode. And yeah, I look forward to hearing some of you guys' complaints on that as well. So I hope that's sort of a OK size for you guys to see, but you can see as sort of time has gone on um, the change in uh, our energy consumption. And you can see in the past that we traditionally used biofuels such as wood and charcoal for our energy. Um, modern renewables were added in the 80s and today. Um, today's energy mix oil makes up just about 50,000 um, nuclear 7000. And hydropower is the renewable with the highest share with um, 10,500. But yeah, I'll give you guys a second to have a look at some of the stats there. Um, and I'd encourage anyone to, uh, if they want to have a look at these further, our world in data sort of breaks down these things really well and um, yeah, really clearly. So uh, check those out if you are interested. Um, So time for a poll. I want to get you guys' um, gauge on what countries you think are doing the most in terms of renewable energy resources and um, sort of green energy in that sense as well. So if you want to sort of put in the chat, so which countries do you think get most get the majority of their energy sources from renewable resources? So over 50 percent. And we'll reveal those answers in a second once some have come through. Excellent. Just waiting for the first ones to come through. We are operating on a kind of about a 30 second to minute lag um, with teams. So apologies, Ryan. Uh, I'm sure some will start coming through and we'll um, yeah, start to shout them out as they arrive. Although we go, we've got one vote coming in for Iceland, uh, a second for Iceland, oh, maybe calling out as we brought them in. Um, oh, someone saying the UK. Uh, yep, yeah, one coming in for Switzerland, another couple of Iceland's. Excellent. Yeah, no, thank you everyone for checking those bits into the chat. Oh, someone's gone UK and Iceland. Um, so splitting their bets. Uh, <laughs> UK or Australia's just come in. Um, ah, someone, someone's gone into a bit more detail and said Iceland because they have access to geothermal energy. Um, so yeah, good shout from Matt there. All right, Ryan, do you want to let us yeah. know? Yeah, so you can see as things have come through, um, yeah, a lot of people were correct with Iceland and um, Brazil surprised me a bit. Um, I think a lot of theirs, uh, I don't want to take an absolute stab in the dark. That has um, completely evaded me where they get a lot of their renewable energies from. But again, our world in data is a place where you can sort of break down where these countries are getting their renewable energies from. And Australia at the bottom, which, um, I assume many of you know because nobody guessed Australia from that. 
So the emergence and cheapening of renewable energy, I don't know about you guys, but when I was younger, a lot of when we were learning about renewable energy, um, the narrative was that they were too expensive to be taken up um, by the majority. And this has changed. Uh, it was true 10 years ago, but the price of electricity from solar has fallen by 89 percent. So in 2020, renewables were the cheapest form of energy. Um, the reason for this large drop in renewables is that they follow a learning curve, which means that with each doubling of the cumulative installed capacity, their price declines by that same fraction. And this doesn't happen with fossil fuels. So while fossil fuels cost relies on the energy they burn um, and the cost of running the plant. So if it's an oil power plant or uh, natural gas, the extraction and um, the price of that extraction uh, attributes to the cost of the power plant, whereas renewables, the price of upkeep is relatively low. So cleaning the um, and maintaining the equipment uh, is relatively low and their fuel is free. So that means that, yeah, the cost of these plants are a lot lower. Although it is important to note that a lot of renewable energy sources do take up a lot more land. So that's um, an, a thing to consider as well. So the case study of Norway, I'm sure you guys have heard about sort of Scandinavian countries doing well in terms of their usage of um, renewable energies and yeah, like Iceland is doing well in that regard. Um, so primarily uh, Norway has been able to use hydropower and it's been doing that for a long, long time now. So um, to provide green energy. So 60% of the country's energy needs are met exclusively by hydropower. Um, this is possible thanks to natural advantages, so this couldn't be the case across the world. Not every country has access to um, the landscape that Norway has and the hydrogen power that they have, but also effective management. Um, it's important to note that uh, Norway has managed its hydropower in a way that minimises the negative environmental impact because hydropower can sometimes have severe negative environmental impact. So, um, when big dam systems can often flood lots of land, um, Norway doesn't always have to do that. Uh, also sort of reservoirs have uh, build up of microorganisms that can again uh, emit a lot of methane. So it's important to note that when it comes to hyd hydropower, Iceland is doing it well. So on a global scale and I'm sure with COP um, coming in the next sort of week or so, you guys are going to hear loads about the Paris Agreement if you haven't heard it already, but and we covered it in a previous webinar. So again, if you want to check out um, our YouTube channel to rewatch sort of anything about COP26, we did a sort of rundown of what's going to happen, um, some of the key things that are going to be discussed and what would make it a successful COP. And we're going to revisit that again in January after sort of the dust has settled from that. But um, the Paris Agreement was an agreement in at COP21 in 2015 to keep temperatures well below two degrees in pursuit efforts to make sure that we stay at 1.5 degrees. So coming back to that magic number that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a balanced framework that kind of understands that um, all countries can't make the transition at the same rate. So more economically developed countries must make more ambitious targets to keeping us um, to keeping us to that 1.5 degrees. What progress has been made towards it? So as things stand, the Gambia is the only country on track to meet their targets, which is very disappointing. And of all available targets known as the NDCs by the 191 countries, um, there will be an increase of emissions by 16% from 2010 to 2030. So the IPCC estimates that this will lead to a temperature rise of 2.7 degrees by the end of the century. So um, obviously we tried to keep things a lot um, very positive, but also that is quite worrying stat. Um, specific to the UK, the UK's domestic target is 1.5 degrees compatible, but its policies and international support don't seem to match up with that. And um, Cristiano Figueres, uh, the Costa Rican diplomat, who is one of the main architects of the Paris Agreement, admits that it did not do enough to embed a sense of urgency. Um, emissions need to be slashed by this year 
to make it possible for the longer term targets to be met over the next 10 years. So there is a serious level of urgency that is needing to happen. Um, one thing that I would also like to mention is the politicisation of the climate issue, which makes some of the um, targets really difficult to reach. So in many countries, the climate crisis has become a political issue with different parties proposing differing policies to address the um, issues with some parties placing it higher than others. So in the UK, this was apparent in 2019 when the Conservative and Brexit Party decided not to attend the climate debate, clearly putting out um, their, how much they prioritise this issue. And in the US, there's a divide between Republicans and Democrats over whether climate change should be a top priority. So 67% of adults who vote Democrat said it should be a top priority, whereas only 21% of Republicans. Um, if we were to address the climate crisis, this must be an issue outside of political cycles. So it can't just be um, in a manifesto, then out of a manifesto, flip flapping between which um, political party is in power at the time. Um, and also, again, we invite anyone to give an insight into the politicisation of climate crisis in their country. I think that could be really interesting to hear how that sort of differs. So um, on to net zero. So net zero is the balancing the amount of greenhouse gas gases emitted with the equivalent emissions that are offset and sequestered by the earth. So to me, the two degrees limit set under the um, Paris Agreement, the world must reach net zero by the second half of the century. Um, in some cases where national and local governments uh, haven't done enough, uh, organisations and um, companies have set their own targets. So mitigation and adaptation, um, again, these are sort of a whistle stop tour of sort of key phrases that we're going to be hearing and key sort of areas around the climate crisis, especially COP as well. Um, these are sort of two phrases you'll definitely hear. You'll hear the two roots of mitigation and adaptation. So adaptation is the anticipation of the adverse effects of climate change. So as you can see in the picture, that's a sea wall in response to the rising um, sea levels. So that's an example of adaptation. And mitigation means softening the impacts of climate change um, by preventing or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So um, cutting down on transport, um, creating sort of car free cities. Um, that would be an example of mitigation. Um, adaptation has been one of the key priority areas highlighted by um, the COP26 president Alok Sharma and UN Secretary General has called for 50% of the total share of climate finance to be set, spent on adaptation and resilience. But it's also important to remember that they are complementary activities. <coughs> um, Matt, have you got anything in the Q&A or? Uh, yes, right. Yeah, we've had yeah one person. Um, yeah, kind of. It looks like it might what you're about to go on to looking at the Green New Deal. But yeah, talking, um, kind of echoing some of the points you were making around um, the divide between uh, Democrats and Republicans in the USA, um, and, and yeah, how it's that politicised uh, football um, as they refer to it. Um, and yeah, it will certainly be difficult to get any kind of consistent change or progress in the US without that deep politicisation. Um, so, yeah, I think it's certainly recognised that, yeah, I think US is kind of one of those well understood examples of that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure that there are many others um, around the globe. So, yeah, keep them coming in and we can um, yeah publish them or, or share them with everyone. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, so, yeah, as we are cons continuing to experience sort of labour progress towards net zero and um, keeping ourselves between 1.5 degrees of warming, I know it kind of frustrates me in many ways. Um, we're seeing a wide range of calls from parties and individuals for a Green New Deal, a policy package that integrates climate action and social justice. So I know this kind of plays on the idea that our current system is broken and that um, yeah, we need a sort of rejigging of our economics to really um, stay within our limits and create a sustainable world. So, um, Alex, uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, 
apologies I've butchered that name but um, has asked for this deal as well and the move is being championed for by the youth-led Sunrise movement and various parties in the UK such as the Green Party and members of the Labour Party um, have also called for a Green New Deal. Um, yeah, again, I'm going to ask you guys, I'm leaning on you guys a lot for this episode, but um, has there been a call for a Green New Deal in your country? I think that could be, if we've got um, yeah, people from all over the world, I'd like to hear which countries are sort of building a movement for a Green New Deal. So the aim of the deal is to decarbonise whilst creating green jobs, um, ensuring a living wage for all and investing in low investing in low income neighbourhoods. So some of the actions that are included in AOC's proposed Green New Deal are providing finance to help communities affected by climate change. Um, as we discussed, these are sort of lower income communities, uh, especially in America and the West. Um, investing in renewables, uh, improving in energy efficiency of buildings. I know that's one of the key issues we've got in the UK is a lot of our buildings are just sort of um, poorly insulated and therefore it requires a lot more energy to heat them than is necessary so upgrading that and upgrading existing infrastructure to withstand sort of the extreme weather. So looking sort of to the future, um, new technologies that are being proposed to um, sort of help with the climate crisis and and it's a contentious area in the climate crisis discussion. Um, so some of the sort of more extreme, um, in my opinion, technologies such as carbon capture. There's also, um, I think it was off the coast of Seattle. They were talking about manufacturing algal blooms that will take in huge amounts of carbon dioxide. But um, and then another sort of I don't know how far this is, but climate repair was that if you release a certain amount of gas, a certain type of gas into the atmosphere, it will cause the clouds to be more reflective, therefore reflecting more um, emissions from the sun, no, so, sorry, um, of the heat from the sun. These are some of the more um, extreme and in my opinion, very dangerous um, ideas to sort of go ahead. Uh, algal blooms are known across the world to be um, if they happen, they kill a huge amount of other life in the area um, and in the process called uh, eutrophication. So that seems very dangerous to me as a proposed solution to um, a problem. Um, but some of the sort of uh, softer, for want of a better word, um, technologies that are being proposed are the advancements in sort of meat replacements. So I know they're talking about um, in my time, yeah, a lot of uh, meat replacements have been improved, but also sort of artificial meat, which would reduce the agricultural aspect of um, uh, the climate emissions. And we'll revisit that in our sustainable food episode. Uh, using insects in terms of as a protein replacement and feeding red seaweed to cows, which um, removes 80% of the methane that they emit as well. So while some are all in on technologies, Others think that they're being used as a get out of jail free card to kick the can down the road um, to say that we'll get ourselves out of this by technology and that it'll all be fine in the future, which I disagree with personally. Hi again, everyone. Just started, yeah, feedback on the question Brian asked around the um, Green New Deal and which other countries have been advocating for it. Um, so someone, um, whether they've come, whether they're in South Korea now and kind of up very late at night, I'm not sure, or if they're just aware of it, um, yeah, shared that um, they've been advocates for a Green New Deal in South Korea. Um, someone's said that um, perhaps it's not exactly the Green New Deal, but have said that um, the Indian government are now paying back houses um, which are creating excess renewable energy. Um, so I suppose that's kind of bringing more renewable energy onto the grid, so payments going out there. Um, also mentioned a couple of people have mentioned um, the calls for it in the EU um, and one person uh, perhaps across the pond from us at least um, said that yeah Canada have also been calling for it. Um, I think oh yeah nice to hear from um, the person sorry you're coming up as anonymous so I can't name you but um, the person joining us from Venezuela saying that um, yeah they haven't had any mention of the Green New Deal um, yet um, but they have been using um, hydroelectric power for a long time. Um, but due to uh, lack of maintenance, um, 
uh, thermoelectric generators have been used more lately. So no, that sounds really interesting. Um, yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. I think it's one of the things I know we really enjoy and hopefully everyone on the webinar gets benefit of benefit from is hearing from kind of all the different people around the world um, and kind of obviously we can only ever be know so much about what's going on beyond our own territory so yeah it's great thank you for um, sharing that and um, yeah keep an eye out for the competition coming up at the end as I'm sure kind of some of those bits of knowledge will um, yeah play into potentially win for you there but yeah no thank you very much for everyone for sharing those bits I'll um, publish a couple of those on the Q&A's and hand back over to you Ryan. Thanks Matt I'd like to reiterate as well the um yeah, thanks for yeah contributing your ideas and this is exactly the kind of um, conversations we want to continue to have in our Facebook group. So um, please yeah, head over there if you want to share these opinions. I know other people who may not be able to attend the webinar would love to hear from you guys in terms of um, yeah things specific to your country, even if that is in the UK opinions, even if um, you might not think of yourself as massively qualified compared to others or you have um, a really specific area, we want to hear from you and we want um, to encourage discussion. Um, so now we're kind of getting into sort of looking in on ourselves. So what is your university doing to tackle the climate crisis? So I've covered um, the University of London, University of Surrey and UCL, the participating um, organisations in this. So the University of London, we've got um, net zero emissions target for 2036. Um, we've already reduced our emissions by 50% against our 2010 baseline. Um, and we're working to decarbonise our heating system in a really exciting project, increase recycling and enhance green spaces in the Bloomsbury area, which is um, where our office is based. Um, we're also engaging our st students and staff and our local and global networks on important sustainability issues through Produce Juice Connect. So this and reaching other people is an important aspect in sustainability, in my opinion. Um, probably would say that, but also um, I think the more people you can have meaningful conversations with, those people have more meaningful conversations with, and you spread the word to um, change sort of um, the sustainability of things from a social aspect as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to have a look at our website or email us for more information about what we're doing. Um, so shared with us by the University of Surrey, then they have a net zero car, um, target by 2030. Um, again, they're ranked really highly globally against the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, they've reduced their water usage by 42% um, throughout water reduction project, projects. And um, again, 74,000 plastic bottles, which uh, incidentally is the next episode we're going to cover on plastics um, but they've yeah added water refill points to remove huge amounts of um, plastic from landfill sites and UCL have a really um, exciting thing that was shared with me before this webinar so UCL have started a new project called UCL generation one turning UCL groundbreaking science into a catalyst for climate action. So a team are headed to COP26. They were also a winner of the Green Gown Award for climate action. Um, they developed the UK's first carbon pricing scheme. And if you're a student and you want to get involved in some of what UCL are doing, um, look up the Living Lab program, which, um, yeah, there'll be further information. I don't want to sort of um, distill it too much but yeah have a look at the living lab program if you're interested in sustainability and would like to get involved or join the UCL student sustainability council so what can you do uh, I feel like some of especially um, this episode I feel like some of the topics that we cover can be quite daunting um, if you feel like yeah there's nothing you can do that is never true um, so take note of the environmental actions of yourself and others. So are you switching off lights and appliances? Is your diet sustainable? And I always encourage people to give yourself a pat on the back for those things. I think we should all um, be proud of, yeah, when we're making sustainable choices um, that positively affect the environment. And even if you've been doing it for a long time, keep thinking to yourself, oh, that is a good thing that I'm doing and we are um, making a difference in that sense. Uh, assess the companies where you spend your money. Are they sustainable or are they greenwashing? Um, and we'll get on to sort of how to spot greenwashing and share 
some hopefully quite um, important examples of greenwashing in a later episode. Um, but yeah, assess where you're spending your money. That's a really important aspect of um, what you can do to affect the climate crisis. And are your finances being invested sustainably? I know um, earlier in the year, we said one of the most um, sustainable things you can do is to look at sort of what your bank is doing in terms of its investments in fossil fuels and such. Also, it's not just we're not alone and um, reaching people who may not be as engaged in this is another um, key aim of this program. So consistently speak to friends and family about the climate crisis, um, attend demonstrations if appropriate and if you feel comfortable within yourself. Um, I have myself and yeah, I found them hugely rewarding and inspiring. And again, they sort of give me um, yeah, a bit of fire to continue when sometimes it feels like um, it's it can feel yeah, when it can feel a bit hopeless. Um, vote. So vote for things and vote for politicians or um, parties that you think are making a good change in terms of the environment. And think if you can develop any sustainability ideas and projects, no matter how small um, in your local area. And yeah, we'd love to hear from it if you guys have any sort of sustainability projects you're thinking of. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you or if in like later on in the year, just please feel free to share it with us. So now the um, the fun aspect of the webinar, if it wasn't yeah, too fun already. Um, if you were in charge for one day, what policy would you implement to address the climate crisis? So some examples that came to me in the top of my head. So please um, feel free to deviate from these completely. Um, no more fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, education on climate crisis is compulsory. Um, larger investments in cycle lanes is another one. But be creative. We love hearing about how this differs across the world. So if it's specific to your country, let us know why you picked it and why it's specific to your country. Um, we want to keep it sort of maximum a page, but longer is not always better. We've had some great um, entries in the past where it was sort of a paragraph. So page is the maximum, but that's by no means the um, guideline for how long it has to be. And email your response to sustainability at London at um, yeah, ac.uk. And the deadline is November 15th, where the winner will be chosen on November 19th. So if you want to win the prize and you want to be invited for an interview, get your submission in by November 15th. Um, so the prizes are a tree print by Eric List Linton. Um, yeah, this was one of the prizes last year and I was really like blown back by how beautiful it is. Um, and then a zero waste kit with backpack as well. So it could look stylish as well as being sustainable. So yeah, on to the next webinar is on November 16th. That's on plastics. So is there more to the issue than um, perhaps is discussed in terms of making sustainable switches? We'll get into um, sort of different aspects of the plastic. I wouldn't say debate, but different aspects of the plastic issue. And yeah, we hope to see as many of you guys there as possible. So revisiting my question from the beginning of the webinar, um, if you guys have had a thought about what do you think is the most important for addressing the climate crisis? And I thought I'd share with you my thoughts, my personal thoughts. Um, and yeah, open to discussion about sort of my ideas and everything. So um, my thoughts are the appropriate allocation of climate finance to mitigation and adaptation. I think there needs to be a bigger emphasis on climate finance on the adaptation side. Um, infrastructure and agricultural land must be pre protected in areas most risk of the um, extreme weather events of climate change. Um, and these are often in areas where the funds can't be allocated to climate adaptation. So this should be shared across the globe as the climate crisis is a global crisis. Um, I'm just going to put in the chat as well, the Facebook discussion group where I'm feeling a bit lonely at the moment as I'm the only one who shared my opinion. But um, yeah, I really encourage you guys to sort of share your opinions on this topic. And yeah, please feel free to answer any questions. But thank you guys for um, joining me today.
Um, and yeah, the next slide has all our sort of details of our socials and everything. So yeah, now's time for questions. Um, you can grill me or disagree with me if you wish. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ryan. We're just waiting for some of the questions to start coming in. Um, we've had another comment come in from um, Venezuela. Um, yeah, just explaining how um, one of the universities there, um, the University uh, Universidad de Los Andes, um, has a recycling program so that people can go there on a monthly basis and recycle their waste. So yeah, I think another really interesting example of, I suppose that's kind of how communities can, uh, sorry, universities can engage with um, their local communities to, to drive sustainability. So perhaps kind of a slightly more practical application of um, yeah what we're doing here with Reduce the Juice Connect. Um, I suppose, yeah, to go on your question, yeah, I, I kind of, uh, with what you were saying around what we can do to uh, drive sustainability, I think, yeah, certainly one thing I definitely agree in terms of um, that that requirement for finance. I think with much of the decarbonisation, a lot of the technology we have is there, a lot of the knowledge is there, we know what we need to be doing, um, but in many cases, the, the, the money isn't the money isn't made available for that for that to occur. Um, the money's there. The money is there on the on the planet. The money exists. It sits in people's pockets. Um, but yeah, it's not being invested uh, as of yet. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's kind of one of the real. Um, one of the real big pieces, I suppose. Um, I suppose another one that comes to my mind is um, having that political will. So I know you touched on it during the webinar, um, but having that political drive um, to make changes. Many kind of institutions and organisations will make it, well, will have to make a change if it becomes mandated, but if it becomes law, if it becomes a requirement. Um, but often until then, it's really hard for people to make a business case for said changes. Um, so I think, yeah, it needs that government drive and that government will. Um, today is quite an interesting day in the UK. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, new um, information has been published in terms of the government's plans to get um, the UK to its net zero target by 2050. Um, and quite a lot of the, quite, quite, quite a lot, there has been a fair amount of criticism of, of what's been proposed, um, particularly in terms of um, yeah, much of it not being mandated, as I've just said, and um, the government saying that it's kind of for businesses to drive the change. So I think it's, yeah, it's always kind of, I suppose each side always wants the other to drive the change. And I think at some point we're going to have to have one side to drive that change. So um, yeah, I think that's a, that's another piece, I suppose. Um, yeah, we've had a couple start coming in. Um, so yeah, one person has commented that um, creating a consciousness in society is crucial. Um, if people keep on their unsustainable habits, um, change is, is, is not possible. So yeah, I, I think completely agree. And I think it goes back to your point, Ryan, around um, all of us have the ability to be the advocate. Um, we've all got our kind of social networks, we've got our families, um, we've got people around us. And I think the more that we share kind of information that you've covered today and the information that we read in the press, the more we create that consciousness in society. I suppose it also comes back to your suggestion of uh, making uh, environmental education compulsory at university, uh, well not university, but environmental education compulsory. So perhaps that's kind of another way of driving that um, consciousness in society. Um, yeah, what did you think on that one, Ryan? Yeah, definitely agree um, in terms of yeah creating consciousness. And I think um, often it can feel like there's a value action gap between what people care about and what you can see in their actions. Um, but I think just keeping at it in terms of um, having difficult conversations with people, but also not coming at it from a angry aspect or a um, negative aspect, uh, encourage people with uh, praise sometimes for doing some things that we might consider just like normal. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely agree on that. Um, we've had another comment come in from Laura. So yeah, thank you for posting that on Laura. Um, yeah, saying around consumer behaviour. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I suppose it's kind of almost as Ryan was talking about that value action gap, kind of it's having that consciousness and then ensuring people act on it, isn't it? So um, yeah, Laura goes on to say that often there's um, no awareness or no thought goes into the factories we support simply by doing our groceries. And yeah, I think the, the more we understand what kind of goes behind every one of our purchases. So I know last year we looked at um, one of the areas we looked at was fast fashion. So again, take a look on our YouTube channel, which is up on Oh, no, it's no longer on the screen. I can pop that back on the screen, in fact. Um, uh, yeah, on our YouTube channel, you can see what we're talking around about um, sustainable fashion. 
um, is that that's another area um, that has has a big environmental impact. Um, and as you say, kind of, yeah, Laurie, you draw our attention to our groceries. And, and yeah, I think that's another huge piece. Um, that pie chart Ryan shared earlier was a really interesting one, which are, yeah, kind of a lot of um, global carbon emissions come from the from the consumption of energy, but actually the second largest after that um, is agriculture. Um, and, and, and I don't know, it is true that um, meat um, and dairy are the largest contributors, but in fact, um, even uh, kind of plant-based agriculture does have a, a carbon footprint. Um, there are certainly ways uh, kind of ploughing releases carbon emissions into the atmosphere. So kind of virtually all the things we do have that carbon impact. And I think it's, um, as you say, it's making sure that consumers are conscious of their behaviour, of the impacts of their behaviour, so they can make choices to um, reduce reduce those impacts. Um, so yeah, I know again, we spoke previously around food, um, looked in quite a lot of depth at um, vegan diets and what can be done in that regard and kind of what impact that has. But equally, I'd always say kind of it's it's not always about going going the whole way. Um, obviously, if people are vegan and ca or can go vegan, then fantastic, that has a big environmental impact. But I think a kind of increasingly popular dietary choice is flexitarianism, um, whereby kind of you do eat still some meat, uh, but limited amounts and kind of see it as a treat. So maybe kind of once a month, perhaps treat yourself to some chicken or something along those lines. So kind of you can still have that that have that if that if that brings you joy um but you by kind of reducing it to kind of a few times a year you hugely reduce your environmental impact also perhaps choosing the types of meat that you do eat um so red meat has a significantly higher environmental impact than white meats like chicken so kind of next time you're going out for a burger perhaps then go oh, instead of having a beef burger i can have a chicken burger or something along those lines um all those little kind of changes do add up and and, and make a difference um i don't know if you had any thoughts on the consumer behavior there, Ryan? Yeah, consumer behavior is um, yeah, something I think about quite a lot in terms of there's the disconnect between you're constantly told that people need to get spending um, to rejuvenate our economies and it kind of links into, I guess, like a Green New Deal bit. Um, but I feel like people are constantly um, yeah, I don't use the word coerced lightly, but I think people are constantly coerced into spending money on physical goods that, again, concentrate to the degradation of the environment. So um, I think people, especially if you're not too engaged with sort of sustainability and stuff, um, it's quite hard for people to realise and then uh, correct those behaviours. But again, I think just doing a bit of research into when you are spending your money, making sure that it's on a... Um, a sustainable company or um, business as possible or and smaller businesses generally I think I'm correct in saying just smaller businesses in general are more sustainable as well so have a look around your sort of local area um. brilliant yeah thank you very much Ryan um, they are all the questions that we've had coming in so far uh, kind of questions and comments but yeah keep talking on the Facebook page um, I'm aware that thanks to our um, fire alarm at the beginning, we have um, hugely overrun. So yeah, apologies everyone for that. Oh, I speak too soon. We've just had a comment come in um, from Natish um, saying that the Indian government support farmers to install solar panels and cover 70% of the cost um, and buy back the electricity. Wow, that's um, yeah, that, that's a large, that's a huge subsidy, that's 70%. I think um, yeah, it's something, um, yeah, that will hopefully really start to drive that uh, uh, zero carbon um, uh, green energy I in India. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting, um, uh, Nitish, if you've got any kind of details to pop those up on the, the, the Facebook page, because um, it'd, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see kind of the level of uptake there's been. So yeah, in the UK for a while, we did have subsidies from the government for uh, installing um, renewable energy, um, which was sadly removed. But yeah, kind of um, traveling around the UK, you'll often see former farmland, which has been used for solar panels. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I think it's, yeah, hopefully kind of it'll have an equally good up or has had equally good uptake in India and will start to start to really make a difference. Um, so yeah, um, Ryan, I'll let you, um, sign off, but yeah, thank you everyone from me for joining us and yeah, look forward to seeing you at the, the next webinar.
Yeah, I'd like to yeah, sort of reiterate what Matt said in terms of thank you for sticking with us with one of the most unluckily timed for me fire alarms that have happened. Luckily, there wasn't a fire or anything, but um, yeah, thank you for sticking with us with the delayed start. And I've really enjoyed um, speaking with you guys over the chat and yeah, sort of sharing my thoughts and hearing your thoughts on sort of the climate crisis. Yeah, and I'm hopefully looking forward to as many of you as possible. Um, coming to the plastics webinar that is happening on November 16th. But again, if you want to revisit this webinar or just share it with your friends, um, head over to the YouTube channel where we'll be uploading this on Tuesday and then yeah, send it over to other people who might be interested as well, if, yeah, if appropriate. But thanks guys.